All right, well, thank you for joining everybody. Um, my name is Judy Jeremo. I am the analyst that supports the Learning Aligned Employment Program. Um, we're gonna go over the program itself today, as well as um, data reporting and web grants. Um, I believe everyone is already muted, so um, feel free to ask questions in the chat, or if you wanna ask it live, just raise your hand and we can unmute you. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my video just for a little bit better quality. Okay, so our agenda for today, um, we'll go over the LAPE program, the institutional eligibility, the student eligibility and the employer eligibility. And then we will go into data reporting and go through um, some of the web grant screens. So the Learning Aligned Employment Program, or LAEP, is basically a new and improved work-study program for California. It offers eligible underrepresented students at public colleges and universities the opportunity to earn some money to help reduce their education costs, while at the same time gaining education-aligned career-related work experience. The California Student Aid Commission is responsible for developing the program guidelines and supporting campuses as they roll out LAPE this academic year. So why the Learning Aligned Employment Program? Well, it's another tool to help um, students afford higher education. It promotes equity across the student population, and it better aligns higher education with the current needs of today's workforce. And finally, it bridges the gap between college and career for students. All public universities and colleges are eligible to participate in the program. So the University of California, the CSUs, and the California Community Colleges. In order to participate, each institution need to, needed to sign an agreement with the commission as of this past June 30th. And we're really pleased that over 98% of the eligible schools did elect to participate. Funded over two year, two budget cycles, LAPE was allocated $500 million in the state funds. The funds were allocated to institutions based on their share of students receiving a federal Pell Grant in the most recent prior fiscal year for which data was available. LAPE is a nine-year program, but the commission distributed all of the funds last August. Funds will just roll over each year and will be available to participating campuses until the program ends on June 30th, 2031. Institutions may use up to 5% of the funds received for the administrative costs of getting the program up and running. And here are the numbers. So we have, uh, there were 147 eligible schools and 144 elected to participate. It was all of the UCs, all of the CSUs and all but three of the community colleges. And if you look over to the right-hand side, you can see 56% um, of the funds um, are going to the, into the California community colleges. I'll stop here. Any questions on institution eligibility? Okay. So a student from an underrepresented background must satisfy all of the following criteria to participate in the program. They must have a minimum of half-time enrollment. It can be full-time, they can be three-quarter time, but at a minimum, they must be half-time enrolled. The exception is the summer term, which I'll talk about it in a minute. They must have California resident classification. They must maintain SAP according to the institution's policy. They must have demonstrated financial need, and they must be eligible to work in the United States. There's a lot of words on these, this slide and I'm not, I'm not gonna read them all. Um, 
but underrepresented is the is a cornerstone of this program. Unfortunately, it was not defined in the education statute. So early last year, CSAC um, put together the broadest definition that they could come up with in order to let as many students as possible participate in this program. So half-time enrollment is defined by the institution and should be included in the institution's disbursement policy. To be eligible to participate in a summer LAPE opportunity, the student must be enrolled at least half time in summer courses required for completion of a degree or certificate. Or if they're not enrolled in the summer, they must be accepted for enrollment on at least a half time basis for the following normal academic term, so the fall term. In the event that there are limited funds or limited opportunities, students should be prioritized as follows. First generation college students, current or former foster youth, students who are homeless or at risk of being homeless. If additional prioritization is required, these students would be prioritized by majoring in a STEM discipline. The maximum number of hours a student can work and their maximum compensation are set by the institution and should be included in the employer agreement. Institutions are not required, but they are strongly encouraged to consider awarding the student academic credit. Institutions are required to report data on late funds expended, the student population served, and employer profiles. And I'll pause here to any questions on student eligibility. The following entities are eligible to employ LAPE students. The first one is this participating school itself, so the UC, CSU, or the community college. These positions must provide students with direct opportunities to participate in research. This is not limited to scientific research and research is defined by the institution. The second type of employer is public schools operated by school districts, county superintendents of schools, the Department of Youth Authority or the Department of Education. Students should be working in the school itself, not in a district office. And then the final category is non-religious, non-political organizations or corporations. They can be non-profit or for-profit enterprises, but they must be licensed to conduct business in the state. Additionally, they must be capable of providing or capable of connecting students with other employers capable of providing full-time employment opportunities within their areas of study after graduation. They're not required to hire after graduation, they just need to have the ability to do so. In order to participate, each employer must sign in an employer agreement with the institution. And a student, this point is really important, it's, it's key to the program. A student must only be placed in an educationally beneficial position that relates to the student's area of study, career objective, or the exploration of career objectives. The student must be paid at a comparable rate to that of comparable positions within the employing organization. So they shouldn't be paid less because they are a student or because they're working part-time. And the position cannot displace workers currently employed or impair existing contracts for services. So the type of employer determines how much late funds can be used. If the employer is a public school or a nonprofit employer, up to 90% of the student's wages can be paid with late funds. If the campus is the employer, 
up, up to 100% of the students' wages can be paid with late funds. And then finally, if the uh, employer is a for-profit company, up to 50% of the students' wages can be paid with late funds. Any questions on employer eligibility? Question in the Q&A, you're, you're saying up to, that's the wording in the, in the statute. Um, so you could technically pay, pay less. Um, I haven't heard of anybody that wants to do that yet. Any other questions? All right. All right, so that is um, the web grants overview. Went pretty quickly. I thought there would be a few more questions. Um, again, feel free to put questions in the Q&A or in the chat, um, or I believe if you raise your hand, um, we can take you off mute. Okay. Well, let's move on to data reporting and web grants. Participating institutions are required to report data in web grants no later than September 30th, following the end of each fiscal year. If you are a system administrator for your institution, you should automatically have access to late screens as they come available. So there are two screens available now, so you should be able to see them. If you are already a web grants user at your institution, you may need to have your system administrator add the late screens to your access profile. And if you've never used web grants before, but you are gonna need it for late, um, you'll need to request access from your system administrator. If you're not sure who that is, feel free to email us at late at csac.ca.gov or you can also ask your financial aid office. So here are the screens that are available in web grants. So phase one is complete. So there's two screens that you can access right now. Um, one is the student employment data. And the second one is the manage ACA data. Coming this year um, is phase two, and that will include interest tracking on the funds and a reconciliation summary and detail report download. And in phase three, um, which is TBD in terms of timing, would be the demographic summary and the detail report download and also the file upload option. So that, that would allow you to upload multiple students at a time. All right, so if you have your web grants access and you've logged in, um, depending on if you've used web grants before, you may have other menu choices, but what you wanna look for is this picture over here of LAPE. And then you can select either the student employment data or the manage ACA data. If you wanna um, move around between the two available screens, you do not have to go back to the home page. You can just go to the navigation menu, go down to the LAPE menu, and then you can access the other two, the two screen choices. So just another way to get to the screens. So if you select the student employment data screen, this is what you will see over here. You'd put, enter your school ID, select the academic year. If you're looking for a specific student that you may have entered already, 
you could enter the DREAM Act ID or the social security number in search. If you look, want to look at all of your data, just leave that blank and click search. And then anything that you've entered um, already will show up down in this part of the screen here. If you see something that you need to edit, there should be a little I icon next to the student's name, and you can just click on that and edit the data. If you want to add a student, you just click on the, the blue add a student button. And this is the screen that you will see. So for student details, the required fields are the first name, the last name, the DREAM Act ID or social security number, and the date of birth. Everything else is optional. If you're filling this out and then got distracted by someone coming to your desk and just tried to upload it, you'd get this error message. So it would tell you what you still need to include. We're trying to make it as easy as possible for um, to get the data in with, without any errors. So if something pops here that you're missing, just click OK and go back and correct it. After you've put in the student date details, you can scroll down to the LAPE program details. All of the fields are required here. So you need to select whether you have a STEM student, yes or no. You need to select whether the student is receiving academic credit. We have this as a default, no. Um, but if they are receiving credit, go ahead and click yes on that. All of the remainder fields here are the underrepresented descriptors. They're set at default as no unknown. And you should just go ahead and click whatever criteria um, that fits. We encourage you to uh, cl click yes on all that apply. However, only one is required to submit. And we have um, requested a, um, an enhancement from IT to add down here students with dependent children and also to reword incarcerated to say formerly incarcerated. If you select yes as a STEM student, a pull down menu will um, open up. We've just, we've just put in basic STEM majors. Um, if I know that people define STEM differently, if, if these choices don't work for you, just leave it blank. It's not a required field. And if you thought you checked an underrepresented descriptor, um, but it didn't actually take, um, when you try to submit, it will let you know. Just click OK, and you can go back and correct that. All right, after you've finished with the LAPE details, you'll scroll on down to the student employment data. And this is what you'll see. You'll see the, the required fields are employer type, gross wage, oops, excuse me, gross wage and late funds expended. Depending on what you select for the employer type, different boxes will open up. So if you select campus employer, research mentor, type of research part, type of research and employer partner, will open up for you. As you can see, research mentor is the only required um, field there. Type of research and employer partner is optional. And as always, gross wage and late funds expended are required. If you select any of the other employer types, public school, nonprofit organization, or for-profit organization. This is what will open up over here. 
Under employer name, if you've, in, if you've entered employers already for other students, when you open up this pull down menu, you will see those again. Um, if you have a new employer, you will select other and then a box will open up for you to type in that name. I'll talk about employer industry on the next slide. And again, gross wages and light funds expended are required. If you have other, um, if the student's working in a, another job during the academic year, um, just click on other, add other employment details and you can add that information. Okay, this is not as scary as it looks. Um, this is employer industry. There is a pull down tab that will have all of these, all of these titles. Um, we are using the NAICS um, codes that are standard. I do not know what NAICS stands for, um, but it probably says it if you go to this link in their website. They're pretty broad fields, um, but I found in, um, some are pretty obvious, you know, educational services. I found that if you just Google a company name and ask for the NAICS code, it usually comes up. It's a six digit number. You just take off those first two digits and that'll tell you what to select. Is gross wage the hourly rate or the total wage is earned? The gross wage, oh, well, there's the answer. <laughs> So essentially, if a student's working 20 hours and making $20, the gross wage would be $400. And then if you click Submit to add your student with all of the employer data, um, if you accidentally put the wrong number in um, for a campus employer, um, it will tell you that you can't have late funds higher than the gross wage. I actually did that when I was playing around with the system yesterday. I put gross wages at 1,000 and I got a little carried away and I put late funds expended at, at 10,000. So the error message would catch that. Same thing for public schools um, at 90% and nonprofit at 90% and for-profit at 50%. Any questions on the student data screen? Okay, so the second screen that's available now is a manage ACA data. And this one's pretty straightforward. You enter in your school ID and the academic year. And then you can click search and it will show you anything that you've previously entered. And again, you can use the little eye icon to the left to edit any data that you've previously entered. To add ACA data, you click on the little button, it will open up this screen and you can put in the amount and the description. We pre-populated the pull-down menu with some common um, expenses. And if you don't see what you like there, you can just select other, and then it'll open up a box for a brief description. Any questions on the ACA data? Okay, for what what do institutions need to be doing in 2022-2023? The institutions, all institutions are expected to enable participating eligible students to access available learning aligned employment opportunities no later than June 30th, 2023. It's totally fine to start small. Um, we have time in the nine years to scale up um, at starting next fall. And if you get stuck, reach out to the LAPE team. We'd be happy to help connect you to resources and other participa participating institutions in your area that, that perhaps are a little farther along.
And then finally, um, we have a lot of resources available. Um, feel free to go to our website, www.csac.ca.gov slash LAEP, L-A-E-P. We have the handbook there, FAQs, um, slide decks, uh, an employer agreement template, and then some of our, our webinars. And always free, feel free to email us at LAEP at csac.ca.gov. And that is the presentation. Um, we have plenty of time for questions if people want to, again, put them in the chat, put them in the Q&A, or raise your hand and we'll take you off mute. Go ahead, Amy. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, so I'm relatively new to this. I'm actually teaching the career education department now, and I'm taking on this role. Do you recommend you know, looking at what the student interests are and then approaching employers or setting up with employers and then hoping to match students with those employers? Um, I think you could really do it either way. Um, it probably depends on how many students you have or how many employers you have in your local area. Okay. Thank you. Certainly. David, go ahead. I think. You hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm David Hall from the from Santa Monica College. I'm actually taking lead on the um, the, the lead program as we speak. Um, one of the, the things that we are I'm trying to work through is understanding the the pay rates, uh, like the classification for each student um, that go through the program. We're gonna just start off internally and um, have individual departments um, take on, you know, students to work within the department within their specified field. So the question comes up, um, you know, how, okay, so how do we choose the pay rate? Uh, is this something that HR needs to create, like a, a certain classification um, that we can maybe have a student go through or, you know, Currently, we, we're going to mirror the, the financial aid department's uh, workers, I mean, student worker uh, process, application process. But with our student worker, they're only making $15 an hour. That's what the classification or the, the, uh, the object code is, is um, set at. But of course, with the elite, the pay rates could be uh, a lot higher or be higher. So any suggestions on that? I think it it varies by institution. I know a lot of um, a lot of schools are trying to use existing student job categories that they, that they have. Um, but you're right; some of the the hourly rates are lower than would be paid for a research position. And then I've heard other schools have had to create um, some new positions in order to meet okay. the research requirement. Um, okay. So it really depends on your school and your HR organization. Okay. The other thing I would suggest is we do have um, Q and A ses sessions, drop in Q and A sessions once a week. Okay. Uh, um, and you could um, join those if you have time and ask some of your peers what they're doing. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you. Sure. Other questions. Michael. Hello. Um, I'm calling from I'm Michael Williams over at Pierce College. I just had a question. Um, are medical benefits uh, required for, for, for these positions for, for students? 
They're not required um, by the, the LAPE program and LAPE funds cannot be used for benefits. Um, however, I, I do know that some campuses, they do require mandatory benefits. But again, that, that would be, need to be paid for by another funding source. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. More questions? Don't be shy. We have lots of new people here, so there's no um, there's no wrong questions. Amy. Yeah. Um, so I teach at Santa Rosa Junior College. We're running a, um, and I teach in the ag department here, but um, so our school farm has student positions, but my understanding would be that those, if we were using those as internship positions, they would have to then be research-based positions. Is that is that right, true? And then how are, you know, we're talking about hiring into other programs within the school. Is Do we know how other people are handling that? So it does have to be um, a significant component needs to be a research, but it doesn't have to be scientific research. So your school can determine um, on the farm what what would be good research. It, it, it doesn't have to be it's whatever you define it. And we haven't defined it because we don't want to set any limits on it. So um, I would say be creative. Um, okay. That it does need to have a research mentor, so somebody who's you know directing the work of what that student is doing. Okay. But if you think back, if you look back to um, our um, web grants uh, portion, you only need to provide a CSAC the research mentor name, not what the research is. Oh, okay. That's a that's a nice little. Are, are you so you don't have to. Okay. We don't, have to, we don't have to approve it when if in the event of an audit down the line, mm -hmm. you, you'd need to explain what the research, you know, how you captured the research, but, okay. um, but would, don't, we don't. would then you have to have some sort of like data or like hypothesis as, as part of that, that research piece? It's however you define it. Okay, perfect. Great. Thank you. Okay, um, Janessa. Hi, I have a question. You had mentioned uh, summer 2023. Um, the student would have to be enrolled in half time for the summer and be enrolled in half time in the fall as well, right? Was that a, like, both of those criteria had to be met or is that like an either or? No, so if the student is not enrolled in any classes in the summertime, they mm -hmm. must, they can work and they can work full time if that's available. Um, yeah. But they must be enrolled in the fall for a minimum of half time. Okay. So let's say worst case scenario, because we see this a lot in community college. Um, let's say we hire a student and they work in the summer because based on this, on the situation that you're saying that they're enrolled in half time in the fall. And then let's say they just drop off <laughs> the face of their earth and they're gone, right? And we don't see them. Um, How would you guys handle that? <laughs> well, unfortunately, then they would no longer be eligible for the program, okay. but you would pay them for the, the time that they the worked. The time that they, they worked. Okay. When they were eligible. Perfect. Thank you. Don't be shy. Is there any part of the presentation um, people would like to see again to get um, more understanding? Just let me know, put it in the chat. Go ahead, David. Yeah, I'd like to have one more uh, 
I don't know if it's a question or a concern, but of course, since you know everything is so new, are, are there any big no-nos that uh, schools need to watch out for um, while we're developing and, and getting this program off the ground? Things that are, you know, something that we need to keep in the back of our mind that will put us in, you know, in, in awkward situations. Um, big no-nos. Well, I think, I mean, research is a big component for the on-campus jobs. Um, I think uh, keeping documentation of everything that you've done um, in terms of both research, in terms of um, payment processes, who's who's actually paying the student. Um, I think all of that documentation is really important. Okay. Um, Thank you. A big no, no, nothing comes right to mind. Let me feel free to jump in if you can think of something. What was it a big no, no for, for? Just being new to the program and getting it up and running. Just. Oh, that's a good question. I know. I, I would say that um, just in general, we're not, uh, we're trying to keep things as open as possible because the point of this program is to try to do something innovative. This is a like a, kind of a new type of, um, improvement on work study and we're starting this in California. So I would say, I would say, don't focus on the no-nos. I mean, obviously don't intentionally break any rules, but we're trying to be innovative. So focus on the possibilities. And then if you come up against anything and you're not sure, um, let us know, but we've tried to, um, include as much detail as possible in the, um, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the late handbook that's available on the website. Um, so if you have any questions, you can email um, Judy at the late email address and um, we're happy to take take any questions. But um, yeah, I, I would say don't focus too much on the no-nos, just uh, focus on the possibilities. Have it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Megan makes a good point from the financial aid perspective, just being mindful of the student's cost of attendance. Great. Thank you. Um, Judy, there were a couple people in the Q&A section that asked about the deadline to get started. I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit. Like, oh, uh, I didn't see for that. 22-23 year? Yeah, so the ex in the statute, um, the expectation is that each school will have um, the program available to students in the 2022-2023 fiscal year. Um, so that is June 30th. Um, of this year. Um, so we're encouraging people to get started during their spring term, um, but the summer term would also work. And you can start small, like I said earlier, you know, even one student is, is a good, good start. Once you get one going, it, all of the others are going to be easier. And yes, Melina, we will send out a copy of the presentation to everybody who's who joined today. All right, I'm going to stop the recording, um, but 